sensitive social protection in the Caribbean webinar. This is the fifth webinar in the gender sensitive social protection series, an initiative of the International Policy Center for Inclusive Growth and the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. My name is Raquel Tebaldi, I'm a researcher at the IPCIG and I'll be the moderator of this session. Next slide please. Um, our panelists today are Benedict de la Brière and Mario Esteban Sosa. Benedict de la Brière is a lead economist with the Gender Cost Cutting Solutions area of the World Bank Group. In this position, she works on women's economic empowerment and access to assets and oversees the production of sex disaggregated data. Prior to this assignment, Benedict has focused on social assistance mainly cash transfers, nutrition and work prep programs and social protection strategies in Africa, the Middle East and North Africa, and Latin America at World Bank, FAO and DFID, both on program implementation and evaluation. A French national, Benedict holds a PhD in Agriculture and Resource Economics from the University of California at Berkeley. Next slide, please. Our other panelist today is Mario. Mario Esteban is a social innovation analyst at the technical directorate of the social policy coordinating cabinet of the vice presidency of the Dominican Republic. He previously worked as head of economic development at the office of strategic planning of the city of Santo Domingo and as a fiscal policy analyst and coordinator of the human rights observatory at the Centro Bono. Mario Esteban is a graduate of Azar College in the United States. So before we start with our first presentation today, I would just like to remind everybody who's joining us today that you can send your questions via the chat bar on the GoToWebinar application. These questions will then be directed to the panelists at the end of the session during our question and answers. So Benedict, over to you. Thanks Raquel and thanks for the introduction and for inviting me to this um, webinar. So I'm going to um, try and discuss what has been done in, um, in trying to um, in make gender equality effective through um, social assistance programs. And, um, in as much as possible, I'll, uh, I'll refer to initiatives that have been taken in Latin America, but I'm also drawing on some work by Karine Claire, Nicola Jones, and Shubha Chakravarti here that have looked at programs um, across the world. So the first conditional cash transfers conditional cash transfer that was evaluated was Progresa. Um, in Mexico, which is now um, called Prospera. And if you recall, that program had a very strong um, concern about gender. The benefits were different for different types of children um, by age and by sex. And there was a strong notion that um, to improve health and nutrition status and to break down the intergenerational transmission of poverty, women were a key, um, were a key actor in that, um, in that domain. So from the beginning there was a sense coming from the intra-household literature that you know, health and nutrition were probably in the decision spheres of women and to improve the, the human capital of the next generation, probably it was most, most effective to, um, to go through women. I think after that, um, that very explicit focus on gender in that program, um, there was not so much that was taken into account. I mean, a lot of programs give transfers to women, um, but I've rarely seen uh, in, since then, much consideration about sort of um, taking into account women's constraints versus promoting uh, real gender equality. 
So if we think about gender equality and social protection, what are our hypotheses? Next slide, please. So there is this, um, there is this notion that gender equality and social protection can be self-reinforcing. Can I have the next slide? So in one direction, if I take into account um, gender differences, differences between men and women, I could have improved poverty reduction impact of SP projects. And so these impacts would be about health, education and skills, uh, employment, productivity, asset ownership, and intra-household domestic uh, intra-household decision-making, including um, domestic violence. Can I please have the next slide? Or are you seeing the next slide? Because I don't see it. Okay, thanks. Um, so what program have done in that um, respect is to look at who receives the money, um, to think about whether Unconditional or conditional cash transfers are the best uh, way to do these things. And um, in public works, to look, um, to look at the choice of works or the flexibility around the work um, to take into account time use constraints that women face. There is also an hypothesis that the relationship between gender equality and social protection can be um, the other direction, that if we um, contribute through social protection intervention to poverty alleviation and improved socioeconomic status of households, then maybe uh, women's empowerment will improve and gender inequality will reduce. And here, um, I think there is a big research or analytical agenda on whether how how that really works. Um, in particular when we work in when we do programs in areas where most of the households are non-nuclear, um, that is they could be multi-generational, they could be polygamous, they could be missing generation household um, where you have grandparents taking care or grandmothers taking care of orphans, um, we don't really know how the resources, including those that are provided by the social assistance uh, intervention, we don't really know how they are pooled, how they are shared, and how risk is shared um, within dif among different members of these households. Um, we know little about the effects of different interventions on key, um, key gender gaps such as early marriage and teenage pregnancy. So what I want to, to do now is kind of summarize um, what we know. And could I have the next slide, please? Next slide. So the World Bank um, impact, the World Bank Internal Evaluation Group uh, took stock of the impact of various um, social protection programs on sex disaggregated outcome um, two years ago. Could you please go to the third slide? Thanks. So as you see, most of what we know in terms of impact comes from Latin America with the growing uh, evidence of about program um, in East Asia and some in Africa for um, conditional cash transfers. And then if, next slide please, if we look at public works, the evidence comes mostly from, Latin, from Africa with, of course, a um, serious body of evidence from the South Asian region, notably with 
and Rega in India, and some programs in Bangladesh and in Indonesia. And so there is, so what this review does is that they looked and all the information they could gather, gather that was disaggregated by uh, male and female outcomes. Next slide, please. So, what do we know? I mean, no matter whether programs explicitly took um, gender differences into account in their design, at least in Latin America, we know that impacts are different for uh, men and women and for uh, girls and boys. So for example, in, um, in education, um, the evaluation by Jerry Berman and, and colleagues find greater impacts of the program in Mexico on boys' progression through school, um, decreased employment, decreased unemployment, sorry, and migration, um, delayed marriage, and here the point is, remember that I mentioned at the beginning that Progressa had higher amounts for um, girls based on the reasoning that girls were most at risk of dropping out of school um, in that time. And yet we see a greater, amount, greater impact on boys, um, but these impacts are very strongly mediated by school inequality. That is, in areas where schools are not good, we won't see anything happening. And if um, in areas where schools are good, we'll see, um, we'll see these impacts. And in Africa, what we see is that the impacts are strongest on the less preferred children, um, who could be girls or who could be higher ranked children, in the sense that you know, if households decide that they're going to send um, the eldest two children to school anyways, when they receive the cash transfer, it was mostly matter for the third children, the marginal kids. And in a sense, I think what these impact evaluations are telling us is that cash transfers are, are effective to bring the marginal kids, the ones that would be at risk of dropping out, whether at the transition between primary and secondary schooling, whether because um, they find better uh, alternatives, they have better options on the job market or better quote-unquote <coughs> options in the marriage market. On labor and productive assets, which is <coughs> always um, a concern with policymakers, there is very little um, evidence in Latin America that cash transfers impact labor force participation except for mothers of several children in Brazil. There is evidence of investments into household, i.e. Um, women-run businesses. And again, here, there are quite a bit of difference between uh, Latin America and Africa, where um, labor force participation of women is shown to increase. Next, please. So, in terms of the gender of the transfer recipient, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, in Latin America, uh, most transfers, nearly all transfers that are related to human development outcomes, target women. Um, in Africa, there was some experimentation, notably in Morocco and in Burkina Faso, about allocating transfers to men and women. And we don't see really big differences. Um, there seems to be more differences between unconditional or conditional cash transfers. And in a sense, that reflects, um, for example, in Burkina and Morocco, that reflects the fact that fathers may be the ones taking decisions about human capital in those cultures. In terms of domestic violence and empowerment, um, remember the this idea of spheres of decisions, uh, whereby women are tasked with certain um, tasks or certain responsibilities. And on domestic violence, we see um, maybe a bit of decrease in Mexico and Ecuador, uh, mostly because women get more space to move within their spheres. But there's not um, much changes into the spheres, that is, 
Um, the feminists very often accused cash transfers of consolidating traditional gender roles and sort of highlighting the fact that the woman should or maybe the main caregivers for children and within and we are not changing the fundamental distribution of responsibilities within the household. Um, we what we've seen um, so there are a lot of questions about whether cash transfers um, have impact on household structures through their links with migration, um, whether the mechanisms of citizen feedback uh, that programs put in place encourage or not um, female participation and voice. Um, there is another dimension uh, through which empowerment could happen, but we don't have a lot of evidence, which is through indirect effects um, through access to identification when programs sort of help beneficiaries register birth or get um, national ideas. Um, access to networks and social capital. Uh, when women do things together, they share information, they may uh, solve problems together. And financial inclusion through the use of um, ATM or, or mobile payments. Next, please. So this is what we know. What we don't know are the things that are related to the production, the income side of the equations. We don't know um, whether cash transfers and other interventions um, can help reducing gender gaps in agricultural and enterprise productivity. Um, there is a potential for, for examining complementarities with other programs, um, but there's not a lot of information about that. Um, we don't know much either um, about the impact, the impact of cash transfers on female labor and gender gaps in adult employment in terms of occupational choice. Um, in terms of income, generation, income generating options. And I think, um, in a sense, we're just getting into that, um, that research when it comes to rural um, women. There, were, there was a lot of research about rural women as, as the basis for food security, um, notably through, by Agnes Kusumbing and colleagues at IFRI um, 10, 15 years ago. But I think the part of understanding income generation strategies in different um, environments is still missing. Next, please. So here, what I want to say is that um, targeting women is, is not enough to, to consider that a program is, is gender sensitive. But um, I think it's important to sort of think about what the different dimensions of gender equality, which are about access to endowments, especially education and health, access to employment, and access to voice and agency. And then the poverty outcomes that um, social protection interventions are, are seeking to, to improve. So, I think one very important question is that programs should be clear about what they're trying to change. And the first generation programs were squarely focused on endowment, and they may, or may and, and they were focused on the endowments of the next generation. Um, more recent programs, so the second generation programs have, have also tried to tackle economic opportunities. Um, and here I think the, the perspective has been mostly at the household level, but there's been uh, little analysis about uh, specifically women and men um, differences. So what can we do next? Next slide. Next slide. So I think one issue um, on gender Equality is to understand the political economy. That is, understand uh, how much appetite there is for tackling gender equality in uh, the country, but also um, 
understands that understand that where programs are located is not neutral. Right? It makes a lot of difference whether a program is located in a Minister of uh, Women and Social Affairs or whether it's located in the Ministry of Agricultural and Rural Development as to, um, as to whether sort of the productive impact side will be, um, will be focused. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of the delivery mechanisms, I sure, I'm sure that um, lots of you are familiar with how to sort of um, take into account particular constraints that women face um, to make the design of the programs um, more sensitive to these constraints and to ultimately improve the participation of women in, in those programs. And here I've listed um, a number of examples that you are mostly familiar with. And they're all sort of trying to address three types of issues, time use, um, through childcare or flexible work, working hours, um, mobility constraints, um, sometimes through uh, mobile payments and um, and infrastructure, and then in some sense, um, particular skills training, either to uh, build resilience in terms of sexual harassment or, or domestic violence, or in terms of resolving conflicts and uh, negotiating within the household. Next, please. In a lot of countries in terms of design, um, there are also an effort to sort of take advantage of potential second round linkages through links to either a program like health insurance access to other assets and infrastructure, or um, access to sort of finance, financial services, and sometimes legal services. Next, please. OK, and when we talk about gender equality, um, we need to always remember that it takes two to tango. And so um, to avoid backlash and to really um, change the distribution of responsibility or the, the effectiveness of our interventions, I think it's really important to engage men and communities, especially if we are going to um, try to change not only behaviors but social norms. And it's important both in terms of um, children's school and health needs, um, education and health needs, but also in terms of um, allowing a wider range of occupation for women and enlisting men in, into ensuring their safety. Next thing, next slide please. And so there is a number of emerging innovations about bringing men in parenting um, and care address gender-based violence either through group educations or family development sessions within family. A lot of um, countries in, in Africa and East Asia are um, experimenting with those, um, with those sessions and I think we'll, we'll sort of see more evidence coming in the, in the years to come. And um, last, I wanted to just mention, uh, next slide please, the, the sort of uh, new latest generation of program about um, graduation, which uh, were started by BRAC in Bangladesh and are now um, disseminated in a lot of African countries, where um, there was also an explicit um, goal of the program of strengthening women's bargaining power and position in the household um, through a package of income generation asset transfers, skills training, um, follow-up, both sort of technical and, and social, um, with awareness raising and education about these issues, and a, um, a short-term cash transfer. And they, were, and they are working both at the household or woman level, but also um, at the community level to sort of help uh, move those norms. Next, please. And lastly, um, 
In youth employment interventions, we, we see interventions to reduce um, information barriers, um, to help women shift to so the more um, more profitable activities that tend to be um, male dominated, and last um, to ensure in our programs that all can provide um, feedback and share stories, so that we, um, as program managers or implementers, we can refine the design um, of the programs. But as you can see, I think there is a wide um, range of options that program may or may not have considered and we need a lot more uh, monitoring and evaluation of whether the two hypotheses that I set up at the beginning um, hold or are, um, are rejected by the, exp the experience of the programs. And I'll stop here. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Benedict. That was a great presentation. And now we're going to move to Mario's presentation. Mario, over to you. Hi. Uh, good morning to all. So today I'm going to share a brief experience that we had here in the Social Policy Coordinating Cabinet along the lines of uh, participatory design process and then what we learned about gender geographies and the community of that, of that relations. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to give you first a brief institution overview of how we work in the social policy cabinet. The Dominican social protection system has, has three main pillars. The first pillar regulates um, the labor market. The second pillar is the contributory or social protection system, where waged workers contribute to a private pension fund. And lastly, the non-contributory pillar, or the social assistance pillar is where we work in the social policy coordinating cabinet. While we're meant to coordinate the system as a whole, in de facto we work along three main institutions. The SUBING, which is the sole beneficiary system, which is in charge of basically classifying who is poor. The Progresando con Solidaridad, which is our social educational program, which I'll go into more details in a second. And ADIS, which is a social subsidy administrator that does the financial transfers of the program. I work at a technical directorate, which kind of oversees the social policy cabinet, and through monitoring evaluation unit and our social policy innovation unit where I work, we basically look at what we have and how to make it better. Uh, it's a great job, I'm not going to lie. Uh, next slide, please. Our planning office asked me to add these two slides, which basically shows the summary of how we work in the program. Participatory farm Families who participate in the program have socioeconomic um, accompaniment by the program, have conditional, transfer, conditional cash transfers, and through public-private alliances, make uh, the development of pairing the state services with the offerings. So I think the overview of what we have. Next slide, please. And here's our poverty, poverty exit strategy. I'm trying to be a little brief so we can get to the main part of the presentation. So our, the strategy of Progresando Con Solidaridad is basically capacity building, income generation through, uh, uh, through uh, small-scale farming, financial inclusion, um, emprendimiento, um, entrepreneurship, and uh, ability to uh, enter the job market. Next slide, please. Okay, here we go. So eating is first. In 2003, we had a huge financial crisis. Um, about a million people entered what we came to as the, the official poverty line. The price of food doubled in less than a year. In response to this, in 2004, the government launched Eating is First, or Comer es Primero. This was a new program in the sense that it changed the fundamental sign of the sector of social protection. It went from transferring in, in, in goods to a, deb a debit card transfer. So this marked a huge shift in how social protection was handled in the Dominican Republic. Next slide, please. To give you an idea of how this has grown, and the pilot project began with 6,000 families and currently participate 760,000 families with an annual expenditure of about 7 billion pesos, which is roughly about $180 million. It's a huge program. Next slide, please. 
So here's basically the fundamental design of how a family can participate in the program. The sole beneficiary system has the quality of life index. It's a multidimensional index with a strong, uh, strong weight on the household and the habitat and classifies a family along a, a scale. If you're in the bottom two classificatory brackets, you're considered poor by the Dominican government. Once you have a census of sorts of the, of the country of who is considered and who is not, the, this list is passed to Progresando con Solidaridad, or Progressing with Solidarity. Progresando takes this and starts and begins, uh, when there are funds available, to incorporate these families into the program. Once the family is incorporated, it has a range of uh, different uh, programs and different uh, projects they can participate in. The main one is eating its first. It's about a third of our budget, and, trans and each family gets about 18 US dollars a month for food, uh, for food subsidy. Uh, it's taken to the card, and with the card you can go to private businesses called Colmados, where you can transfer the, we use your, your funds at. So it's not a cash transfer, but it's limited to the, the small scale establishments that participate in the program. Next slide, please. So beginning of the year, uh, we began this process of looking at Comedes Primero. Since it's such, uh, since it's a third of our budget and has such a strong impact in the country, we realized that it's our best strategic option is to look what we have and how to make it better. We began interviewing actors all over the country, the main uh, public officials involved the program, and we began a participatory process with making focus groups uh, with community communities all over the scale all over the country. Since about two thirds of our participants are two thirds of the participating households are female-led or woman-led, we made a strong emphasis that when conducting these uh, participatory process, those voices became privileged, both in the composition of how the focus group were made, but also in how we analyzed information coming in. We wanted to make sure that how we analyzed the, the vast amount of information we received, we were able to distinguish what made an impact along these gender lines. Next slide, please. So after a year of this process, we came with a huge range of things we can improve. Um, but there were two specifically that were marked along gender lines. The first one was gender mobility. What we found is that uh, most of the food was bought on a daily basis. So while you did have the card that once a, once a month we kind of made a bigger purchase, usually you would buy rice and uh, cooking oil, the large part of the rest of the, of the daily food needs was bought on a daily basis. And when female head of households were in charge of the buying the food, their mobility was restricted. This could be for a vast number of reasons, from they were in charge of um, uh, taking care of small children, the elderly, uh, maybe they had, a, they had a small gig or cleaning job near the house, um, maybe the, the cost of transportation was quite high, maybe there was an imaginary of violence or outside this imagined community. So what we basically found was that this mobility for women, we've seen this gray line in the, um, in the slide, was kind of how they would interact on a daily basis. Men, on the other hand, had a larger mobility, meaning that some of them worked as motoconchos, which are kind of moto taxis. So their mobility basically became almost a city scale. They were able to transcend the community. So why was this important? This is important because a woman may have the option of having a bigger uh, store, maybe uh, with less prices, farther away from the home, but they were not access. They could not access that store. They could not access the prices. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And the second big um, result that we found along gender lines was the importance of community debt relations. In the Dominican Republic, we have something called FIAO. FIAO is when you take a good um, and you exchange it for debt. So since the food was bought in the local store, there were primary relations or very close relationship between the store owner, the colmado owner, and the family. 
What this meant was when the family didn't have uh, the money or financial means to buy more food, they could exchange the card for the promise of food later on. I mean, they could change the card without funds now and exchange that when the funds came in, the, the business owner could use the card instead. This is not allowed in the program. The program does not allow the card to be pawned, exchanged, or traded in any way. That being said, this became a very important uh, mitigation strategy for household food insecurity. So much so that women uh, shared with us that they would prefer buying at the local corner shop, which was more expensive than the larger shop far away, just because in the larger shop they couldn't engage in that relationship. Meaning, what they would save from the, the face value of the good, maybe two or three pesos per rice of pound, was less than the benefit that they received from being able to exchange the card. Meaning, the ability to engage in that relationship with a small with a small scale community owner was more important or more valuable than the face value of the good. Next slide, please. One more time. So why does this matter? So in January, we're beginning a process of rethinking Comedes Primero. We're hoping to sit down with everybody involved and see what we're going to do about it. How, how can we improve it? How can we innovate it? What can we do in terms of small-scale pipe projects that generate evidence that will allow us to make a larger change? So along, well, well, as mentioned, well, we have a wide range of, uh, uh, of potential improvements. These two are very important for, in terms of food access for women in households. One, physical access is extremely important due to limited mobility. So if, if whatever we change, whatever we do, we always got to keep that in mind that for the food access, the, the community scale is the scale to keep in mind. And number two is the importance of that relationship. Any change in the design of the program must take into consideration that if you alter that ability to exchange the card in the community shop, you're altering a, a strategy or a, a way to uh, mitigate uh, food insecurity. In many ways, this is kind of our what we got to take into consideration, or what we have to keep in mind, in order to not uh, not exacerbate food insecurity with any pilot project that we do that looks to change or improve the redesign of eating at first. And I believe that. Thank you. <laughs> I believe that's the end. Yes. Thank you, Mario. Thank you so much. Now. We're going to move to our question and answer sessions. Um, we have received two questions for Benedict and uh, two more for Mario. So, to Benedict, um, you mentioned that the difference between transferring the money to women or men does not matter as much as the type of intervention, whether conditional cash transfers or unconditional cash transfers. So, do you mean uh, in terms of children's welfare, such as health and education indicators, or overall? Um, the second question for you, Benedict, is what is the World Bank doing specifically in the domain of gender-sensitive social protection programming right now? What are the main initiatives? Um, and for Mario, um, we would like to know if the co-models are officially affiliated with the program or beneficiaries can use their card to buy food in any store. And if they are affiliated with the program, how are these establishments selected? Uh, what are the incentives provided for them to serve the targeted households or groups? Are there any trainings provided for the households using cards about their rights, the risks, and the redress mechanisms if there are any issues with the stores? So, uh, Benedict, maybe you could start and then we move to Mario's uh, answers. Thank you, Raquel. Um, so the question about um, it, the fact that it doesn't seem to matter whether you give transfers to um, female, the female or males in a household, 
Um, I must say it's based on two studies um, in Burkina Faso and in Morocco. And here, um, what the evaluation showed is that in terms of poverty impacts at the household level, it didn't make a difference. Um, but also in terms of um, access to health and education for the children. And I think partly it goes back to this question of um, who makes those decisions um, for children. And especially in Morocco, um, fathers are very involved into decisions uh, about health and education, notably um, because of mobility issues, but also because they have more control um, about the money and the expenses linked to, um, to health and education. In Burkina, they saw slight differences um, among different types of children, but um, also differences linked to the structure of the, of the household. Uh, notably whether these were polygamous households in sort of complex resource sharing mechanism. And the um, comment I made to, you know, these, these impacts um, don't matter as much as the nature of the transfer is um, are primarily related again um, to impact evaluations from sub-Saharan Africa where um, there's been a lot of unconditional cash transfers and a few conditional cash transfers. And a bit similar to what we've seen in Mexico where a lot of the impacts are mediated through the quality of the school, um, here the impacts are mediated um, through the pressure that is um, put on the one child or the children that are um, that are the targets of the transfers. So, for example, in Malawi, um, we found that unconditional cash transfers had greater impacts than conditional cash transfers, primarily because if an adolescent girl who was receiving a cash transfer, which was conditional, dropped out of school, then the household would lose the the money and the girl had more uh, likelihood to get married early to sort of make up for the lost income in a sense while um, if the condition if the transfer was unconditional even if the girl in that case didn't go to school the households would would keep on receiving the money which um, had a lot of sort of consequences for the individual welfare of that particular child um, Again, what I want to say is that maybe there's, there hasn't been um, that many experimentation in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean about those dimensions, um, partly because of the examples set up by um, Progresa in the early 90s, but also um, because, the, because of the recognition of sort of women as the, as the main uh, responsible for health and education in, in those cultures. And similarly, there's not been much experimentation um, with the unconditional versus conditional part of the of the transfers, um, partly because we are in um, in a political in economy environment where unconditional cash transfers would be much more difficult to accept. Um, so that's a sh sort of relatively long answer to that first question. In terms of what we do at the World Bank um, in terms of gender sensitive programming, um, we are doing quite a bit of work on the um, on sort of the design um, through introducing uh, all these childcare flexible um, flexible time for women uh, differences you know, opening different types of um, of public works in terms of the soft public works. Um, we are trying in uh, we are trying to work more on these issues about um, moving to understand the dynamics within the household and um, adding to the either to the soft conditions or to the conditions participation into sort of uh, positive parent, parenting practices or positive disciplining or peaceful resolution of conflicts. 
um, partly because we are hoping that this would contribute to better um, within households discussions. Um, we are also starting to um, to work on the on understanding time use. And so in several um, countries, as part of the evaluations, we're looking at um, time use decisions. And um, in Africa, we are trying to, um, as I mentioned before, to look at um, what, how we need to change the design or the implementations of the transfer when we deal with, um, with more complex households, because there is a sense that by um, sort of transposing the model of the nuclear household street, we may be uh, missing some of the most vulnerable um, people. And you may have heard recently of a um, big scandal in Uganda with one of our transport projects um, where there were um, large public works and there were issues um, with the men that were working on these public works. So we've set up a um, gender-based violence task force and um, we're expecting that the findings of this task force will probably matter for the design of some of our social assistance interventions. And as we're moving into the sort of um, cash transfer or social assistance in um, conflict and conflict affected situations, the gender dimension of understanding particular uh, barriers facing women, um, Mario mentioned mobility and that's a big issue in conflict affected areas, but also um, options that are open for income generation for women um, becomes um, more salient. I hope I, an I answered the question, thanks. That is great. Thank you, Benedict. Uh, Mario, over to you. Thank you. So yes, the Colmados or corner shops are officially are official affiliated. We have the RAS, which is the Red de Abastecimiento Social, or roughly translated into the Social Supply Network, which is the network of private businesses that are affiliated to the program which basically means they have a specialized um, kind of bare phone, a specialized um, transfer unit, which allows them to have, uh, which allows the participating families to purchase goods in their in their stores. So they are selected through a process. That we have a, a manual that gives the criteria and how these are selected. The shop must have a minimum level hygiene, must be located in an area of concentration of participating families, and there's a couple more that I'll have on top I'll have with me. In terms of there's a huge incentive to participate in the program because it's a fixed um, a fixed sales that come every month, meaning that it's a source of uh, high income for these stores. So there's a lot of competition in order to be part of the program. In terms of training, both the store owners as well as the families do receive excessive training on the limits of the program, what is allowed and what is not allowed. They are, they're given basically the, the, the parameters of what can be done and what cannot. That being said, there's something very important going back to presentation about the close relationship between the store owners and the participating families. Because when there is this kind of complicity between the two, because they be, they're neighbors, they're their friends, they become they're they're close, they have very close relationship. So how does the how do with the garment? How do we know when the car is being pawned or the car is being traded? It's very 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 hard to figure that out. And usually what happens is when there's a rupture in that relationship, when something goes wrong with the negotiation, when something goes wrong with the agreement, we find out because it's usually the same family, the same family who trade the card that calls the, uh, like basically our, I guess our customer service branch and tells us what's going on, tells us that the, what the problem is. So in many ways, the finding out the, in the normality of this relationship is kind of really hard to figure out. I guess were the main points. Okay, thank you, thank you, Mario. There are a few more questions for you. Um, one attendee asked about the FIAO, uh, 
because uh, the, the concept was not very clear. Could you just elaborate it a little bit on what does that mean? And then two more. What, what can you specifically do to address the mobility constraints that were identified for women? Uh, is there any initiative in that sense? And finally, uh, you said that two-thirds of the beneficiaries are female-headed households. Why is that the case and how did you make, how is that targeting decision made? So, back to you, Mario. Thank you. So, FIAO. FIAO is a term that describes that. So, FIAO is when you get a good and instead of paying it with money, you now have a, an accumulated debt. So, meaning if I go and go to the store and get 10 pounds of rice, that would be maybe 200 pesos. Instead of me paying 200, I, I have a fiao, meaning I have assumed that for the worth of 200 pesos. However, what's interesting about fiao is that the relationship of debt is beyond the monetary, meaning just because I pay 200 back doesn't mean that the relationship is canceled. There's still a relationship or a, a debt relationship between those who give you good for debt and not. Let me explain that a little better. The relationship does not end when you pay back the money. The relationship continues when, uh, when you have that transaction going on. In terms of mobility constraint, the Progresando has a large range of projects and programs aimed at this, from income generation to uh, specific uh, capacity building, to allowing um, green safe spaces within the community, but those are usually more longer term, uh, longer term approaches, meaning that trying to increase female employability outside the home, um, including primary infancy, I'm sorry, um, initial location. So we now have a new a new center for the American government has center for. Uh, small children for small like daycare centers, I guess that'll be the translation. And also in the future, we're working on elderly, meaning that will uh, decrease the burden of women who, will, who are uh, through the uh, Dominican patriarchy are usually in charge of taking care of the young and the elderly. In terms of why two thirds are beneficiary of the participants of the why two thirds of the participating families are female households. To be uh, to be honest. The how that historically got constructed, I do not have the answer. However, we do believe that it does give certain degree of uh, decision-making power of the card of the funds translated to the the female heads of households. How much of that perpetuates uh, gender roles and that perpetuates um, different things, I don't have the answer with me. That being said, we do hope that it does allow for some level of economic independence even if it's quite small. Thanks a lot, Mario. So with that, I think we're reaching the, the end of this webinar. I would like to thank uh, Benedict and Mario for their great presentations and thank the audience for joining us today. I would like to remind everybody that you can join the Social Protection.org platform and the Gender Sensitive Social Protection Online community to stay updated on the series. We should be hosting another webinar within the series by in the first months of 2017. Uh, today we're going to send you a follow-up email with a link to a survey and we would like to ask you to answer it to let us know how we can improve our webinars. We will also send within this email the link to the presentations that were presented here today and the, and the recording of this session. So thanks again to everyone and that's it for today.